welcome to all of you here, but we also have quite a webinar audience, so we want to welcome you as well. We'll have a Q&A uh, time afterwards where we can take questions from the webinar participants as well as those of you who are here. We have many organizations uh, linked in. This is a very uh, hot topic. Uh, uh, eager to hear today's speaker, we have uh, FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, Federal Highway Administration, uh, Federal Railroad Administration, Transit Administration, MARAD, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, EPA, Department of Homeland Security, plus a lot of state and local as well as private sector and international uh, participants. So uh, we, we definitely... Uh, want to get going here with all those uh, people waiting to, to talk. We're very pleased to have today's guest as Suzanne DeRoche, who's the Assistant Chief of Resilience and Sustainability at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Probably a pretty new title uh, that, that infrastructure organizations are, are, are implementing. She's been with the Port Authority for five years. Before that, she was an industrial designer. She has her master's from Columbia in environmental science and policy. The Port Authority conceives, builds, and operates and maintains infrastructure critical to the New York and New Jersey region's trade and transportation network. They include the uh, busiest airport system in the country, the marine terminals and ports, the path rail transit system, six tunnels and bridges between New York and New Jersey, the Port Authority bus terminal in Manhattan, and the World Trade Center. For more than eight decades, the Port Authority has worked to improve the quality of life for more than 17 million people who live and work in this region, one that supports 8.6 million jobs with an estimated gross regional product of more than $929 billion. So protecting that infrastructure is a high priority, and with new kinds of risk analysis uh, that Suzanne's going to talk about, uh, we're going to be enlightened on direction of this dynamic organization. So let's welcome Suzanne DeRoche. Thank you, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. As Bob said, I am the uh, Assistant Chief for Resilience and Sustainability. It's a new title. Prior to that, I was the Sustainable Design and Climate Adaptation Manager uh, within the Engineering Department of the Board Authority. So today what I'm going to talk about is a little bit, although in the intro you heard a little bit about what, of our, what our facilities are, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. A uh, quick overview of Superstorm Sandy, uh, what happened, why it was uh, extraordinary, and, and why it had such an impact on our facilities. And I'm going to talk about what our resiliency efforts are, both what we did immediately after the storm, but also what we're thinking about in the long term. So on the left, you can see a map of our facilities. Um, you can note that many of our facilities are coastal. Um, so as Bob said, we have the nation's busiest airport system comprised of five airports total, uh, Kennedy, LaGuardia, Newark, Stewart International Airport, which is north of the city. You can see that in the, in the inset there, uh, as well as Teterboro, which is a general uh, aviation facility. Our bridges and tunnels connect New York and New Jersey over and under the Hudson River and on the west side of Staten Island. Um, as well, we have uh, three bus terminals. The major one is the Port Authority bus terminal in Manhattan. We also have George Washington Bridge bus terminal and a Journal Square Transportation Center in New Jersey. Our port commerce facilities are on, in both states, a uh, major facility in uh, New Jersey as well as in Brooklyn, in, in New York, also coastal. Uh, we have tunnels underneath the Hudson River, Holland and Lincoln, Lincoln Tunnel, and we have run a rail system between New York and New Jersey uh, called the PATH system and as well the World Trade Center. I'm going to focus today mainly on our transportation network uh, rather than some of our, our development projects. So prior to the storm, um, you know, we have 
lots of, of emergency planning uh, for hurricanes. Obviously, east coast of the United States, we're, we're prone to hurricanes. Um, so we do have business continuity plans. We have an emergency ops center, which was activated at about 72 hours before the storm. We started to get detailed uh, weather reports that we would disseminate to key staff um, so that we could plan for closures uh, of our facilities as necessary. So we knew that the storm was going to have a big impact. Um, it was a thousand miles wide. Uh, there was no way we were going to miss it. So we really thought that our major impacts were going to be at LaGuardia Airport, uh, the PATH system, and the Holland Tunnel. That's where we had sort of uh, projected was, was going to be hit the, the worst. So a little bit about the storm itself. Uh, Sandy made landfall late in the evening on Monday the 29th uh, on the coast of, of New Jersey, just south of New York City. You can see in this photo here the direction of the wind, uh, which pushed uh, the storm surge towards our region. Uh, we closed all of our facilities prior to the storm, uh, with the exception of Stewart Airport, which is further north from, um, from the New York City area. The Port Authority bus terminal, which is in the center of Manhattan and, and not prone to flooding in that way. And uh, Lincoln Tunnel, which has very high elevation at the portals um, and so is not as vulnerable. Uh, the next, the following day, uh, you know, I, I work in the engineering department. We are very focused on site visits and inspections, uh, mainly uh, of the structural nature to make sure that uh, our facilities could, could reopen. Uh, we had 39 separate requests for multiple um, across multiple facilities and structures, which, uh, it, you know, if you know anything about what happened, uh, fuel was an issue, electricity was an issue. It was a big challenge to get inspectors out to those sites uh, throughout the region. So the storm itself uh, had as big of an impact because of the nature of its storm surge. Um, the time that Sandy hit corresponded to high tide. Uh, it was also a full moon, and it was a spring tide. So all three of those factors together uh, really uh, elevated the height of, of that storm surge for us as well. Um, and you can see by whoops, the slide before, the direct path of that storm surge because of the wind direction and where it hit south of the city pushed the northern part of the storm pushed the water into that New York Harbor, uh, which serves as sort of a funnel. So the water funneled into, into the New York Harbor. Um, record recorded storm surges. Uh, some of this I know is, uh, is a little uh, known but already, but uh, really very, very high storm surge, not something that we were anticipating. Uh, the public service announcements, what we were being told was about 11 and a half foot storm surge. Uh, it came in at about 14 feet, uh, which is quite, quite a difference. Uh, so you can see here uh, the battery was at 14, Sandy Hook, New Jersey at 13 and a half roughly. So the wind, um, you know, it was downgraded to a post-tropical cyclone uh, when it hit New Jersey. So we did not have um, hurricane force winds. Uh, we had sustained winds about 74 miles per hour with some, with some gusts. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what were the immediate damages and the immediate damages to the facilities. Um, like I said before, there was limited wind damage. Uh, we actually were very lucky that there were not hurricane force winds. Uh, the storm surge caused a, a, enough damage, and had there been stronger winds, we would have had sort of um, exacerbated all of that that damage. We had flooding damage across most of our coastal facilities. Um, again, we did not find any serious structural or major structural deficiencies, uh, but we had significant electrical and architectural deficiencies. Um, we were very prepared to inspect uh, with structural inspectors on call for this kind of emergency. We did not have as deep a bench of architectural and electrical engineers available right after the storm. We were, we were able to find people, but that was some sort of lessons learned that uh, we'll have a much broader discipline base of, of inspectors in the future. 
So at our aviation facilities, um, again, all four of the coastal airports, this is uh, all the airports outside of, uh, with the exception of Stewart, had experienced storm surge on the airfield. On the left, you see Kennedy Airport. Um, this is a navigational aid pier that was shifted by the surge from Jamaica Bay. In the middle, you can see Newark Airport. Uh, this is a bridge with erosion on either side. The storm surge actually came up and over the New Jersey Turnpike um, and onto the airfield at Newark Airport. This is something that we have never seen before, um, which was, uh, you know, obviously damaging also on the way back out when the surge leaves. Uh, erosion happens at, at that time as well. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened at LaGuardia. Um, so LaGuardia did fully flood the airfield. You can see the photo here. Although the, because of how the surge hit and the location of LaGuardia, the surge happened at low tide because the surge had to go all the way around Long Island Sound and then down into the East River. So the way that the mechanics of the East River coming in from the north actually prevented LaGuardia from being flooded more than it was. Um, it did not have that 14-foot storm surge. So that was uh, a good news story for us. Uh, all of the major airports were open by Thursday, which is three days later, which was also a, a big accomplishment for, for our facilities. At our Port Commerce facilities, um, obviously uh, we had storm surge flooding there. They are coastal facilities by nature. Um, at Greenville Yards, we had a runaway barge which um, caused structural deficiency of, of this lift bridge which was, has since been demolished. Uh, at Port Newark um, on the right, a barge actually lifted up on top of one of the berths which did not actually have any structural damage um, which was uh, again, a good news, but many of the buildings uh, and the electrical infrastructure at the ports was flooded. Um, so, you know, there's a concern about uh, the effect of salt water on electrical systems, uh, and we're in the process of studying that now. Our PATH system uh, actually, with st uh, our PATH system had the most extensive flooding of any of our facilities. Uh, on the left here, you can see water uh, coming down the stairway at the Hoboken Station in New Jersey. The middle is a security camera photo from our Exchange Place Headhouse Station. Um, you can see that the water is about at the level of the turnstiles that time. Uh, so we had significant flooding throughout the, um, the parts of the path system that are low-lying. And as I said before, the, the picture on the right is a control panel, um, and you can see what the salt water does to that. It's uh, full of rust. Um, there is, you know, ongoing corrosion because salt, you can't just wash it away with regular water. So there's, um, there's salt in the system. So we're looking at what are the cumulative effects of that and what can be replaced, what needs to be uh, desalinized, et cetera. The PATH system, I just wanted to note here, um, didn't actually get back up to 24-7 service until the end of January. So it was uh, a number of months that we were at partial service. Our bridges and tunnels fared uh, a lot better than the PATH system, um, with the exception of the Holland Tunnel, which was flooded uh, both through the portals and the vent building from, from surge. Uh, on the left there, you can see water is coming down from the ceiling. That's from a vent building uh, and, the, and the doorway down in, from that vent building. Uh, the middle shows flooding coming through the portal. And then the, in the right-hand picture, you can see our inspection crews uh, right after the storm. There's no uh, available electricity um, because the region was out of, was out of power uh, for some time. Our Lincoln and uh, Port Authority bus terminal in Manhattan stayed open the entire time. Uh, Lincoln Tunnel was the only cross-Hudson uh, uh, route through the storm. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did right after the storm in terms of our mitigation and our resiliency efforts. Um, we had, you know, several weeks of just 
getting through the emergency part of of, uh, of Sandy, getting back up and running, making sure that you know everything was was uh, functional, and then we in the engineering department took a, a hard look at what we would need to do cross agency to increase uh, our flood protection, our generation capacity, et cetera. So we put together a really high level list of strategies that potentially could be implemented throughout the agency. Uh, we went through a cost exercise. We went through a um, implementation exercise to see sort of what what might be what might be necessary and what might be useful, knowing that in the coming months we would be looking for um, projects to implement uh, coming out of the the Sandy uh, experience. We also established an internal mitigation team, uh, which is led by our our storm mitigation and resiliency office uh, in our chief operating officer, uh, our chief operating office. Um, they are supported by the Office of Emergency Management, our business departments, which is what we refer to when we talk about our aviation department, our tunnels and bridges, we call them our business departments, uh, finance and engineering. And at the beginning of 2013, we started to look at, well, what do we need to do bef- before the next hurricane season, what are our most vulnerable areas, um, and what can we build in before September was was our target date? Uh, and I'm going to talk about what those strategies were. So this slide shows uh, solutions that we leave in place uh, at a facility, um, and this is all flood protection, water prote- uh, water intrusion protection measures. Uh, On the left, these are are called concrete bin blocks. Uh, They can't actually be stacked that high and still be waterproof. They have sort of a four-foot limit to their height. Uh, We're about 100% done installing those, and we've spent about uh, $1.25 million. And again, these are across the whole agency. This is um, at Teterboro Airport around the lighting bolt. In the center, you see a cast-in-place concrete barrier. Uh, this is for, we use these generally in a constrained area where we don't have a lot of right-of-way um, because you can build them taller uh, and skinnier. And we are about 90% complete. We spent about $6.6 million uh, throughout the system. Uh, the one on the far right there are called HESCO barriers. These are sand-filled geotextile bins. They last about five years, so they're more of a a uh, temporary measure, um, and they are stackable, so we can use these in where we need heights above four feet. Uh, we have about 80% roughly complete installed at this point for about $600,000. This next set of uh, measures are things that need to be put in place right prior to the storm. They're site-specific, and they're, they're use-specific, and so what I mean by that is that For instance, the stop logs, uh, which would go in front of a door or a vent building, uh, something of that nature, a penetration, they have a particular width that they can be, Uh, you would stack those aluminum pieces in maybe a day or two prior to the storm, as long as you don't need access to that doorway. Uh, They tighten down, they're held together um, on a U-channel on the side, they have gaskets, etc., we have about eight and a half million dollars worth of these. So we've used these quite extensively throughout uh, various facilities to protect them from flooding. The water filled barriers, these we're using across roadways. These are for places where we can't shut down uh, more than maybe a few hours or a half a day ahead of an event. Um, and basically they, they only go up to a certain height as well. Uh, we have all of those have been purchased and are deployed. And the last one is called Aquafence. And so this, all, this you're seeing it in place. It folds back down towards the ground. So you can use it in places where you have, you need a low profile. So for instance, this is at Teterboro Airport where we, can't, we have an airfield limitation in terms of height. So we would use that in that location. So as the agency continues to make um, permanent, re- con- permanent repairs as well as provide resiliency to the facilities on an operational level, uh, the engineering department is taking a, a hard look at our agency design guidelines. Um, and we're trying to figure out how do we enhance them uh, to be, when we build a new project, that it's more resilient. 
So f the first topic that I'm going to talk about is the flood protection. Um, so in 2009, we uh, basically came out with guidance that said you're going to build to the 100-year flood level, which is set by FEMA. Uh, code requires another foot on top of that for what's known as freeboard. And then we said for anything that we deem is, is critical or a long, longer lasting um, asset, we're going to put 18 inches on top of that foot to account for sea level rise. So that was in 2009 uh, based on data that we had at that time. Now we have decided to take a, a little bit more of an, an asset specific approach and really dig into what is the life expectancy of this asset? What's its useful life? Is it 20 years? Is it 100 years? And look at the risk of that flood happening over the span of that life and, and, and show that probability that if you have a 100 year asset, that a 1% storm is going to, it's likely 63% chance that you'll have that happen over the course of the life of the asset. So using that and adding to it how critical is this asset, both from an emergency ops standpoint, from a business continuity standpoint, and from a regional standpoint, how, do we, how critical is it? Is it a non-critical asset or is it a critical asset? We have sort of two categories. So we're taking that equation and we're basically saying we're going to add anywhere from 18 inches to 55 inches of height to either a flood protection or to a first floor elevation, depending on the useful life of that asset and its criticality. So it becomes a little bit more of a complex risk-based approach as opposed to saying we're going to build to this height for everything. Um, and we'll do it on an asset-by-asset -asset basis. So in the long term, we've been looking to uh, our regional, other regional efforts to see how to incorporate other risk factors into our design guidance. So New York City uh, has the Building Resiliency Task Force, which is taking a look at all of the building codes and seeing where are there um, resiliency measures that can be incorporated into those codes. Some of them have actually already passed into law at this point. So we're reviewing that information. And as well, we're looking discipline by engineering discipline by discipline to see how other climate stressors like sea level rise, frequency of storms, um, intense precipitation and increased precipitation, uh, increased frequency of heat waves, how does that change how we might design uh, an airfield or a pumping station or an HVAC system. And we're going discipline by discipline to see how each one of these climate stressors might impact, uh, might, might be changed, uh, change our, des our design guidance. Uh, so we're in progress right now. Uh, we expect to be complete by the first quarter of next year. Um, and these will be integrated into our standard design guidance. It won't be a separate resiliency design guideline book. It'll be part of how we, how we do business. So that's what I have today. I'd like to say thank you, everyone, for your time, and I'll take any questions. Well, thank you. Chris, great presentation. Thank you. Um, prior to the Superstorm, you talked at TRB a couple times, I think, about adaptation. I'm curious how, if any, you've seen any of those measures that were already put in place, you know, worked in this situation. Sure. Um, so I think that we had a, an increased understanding of where vulnerabilities might be coming out of the work that we that we did with New York City's um, Climate uh, Adaptation Task Force. Uh, I also think that the additional 18-inch um, height that we were building to on a couple of select facilities was made a difference um, in terms of, of uh, you know, how, how those might be protected. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. Great presentation. Enjoyed it. I grew up in this area, so this was very interesting to me. The only piece that I didn't see in the presentation, did you have to do an assessment of, say, the train yards, the trucks, and the buses, and 
air equipment that uh, would use the facilities. Did you also have to assess that? Sure. Um, I wasn't. Per I wasn't involved in that. The engineering department really works on our capital side, and that's really more of an operational function. So the facilities do that themselves with their own internal um, electricians and and maintenance staff. There was absolutely uh, that part of the assessment was done as well. Trains you might have lost in the process. Subway trains. You know, I, I'm I'm not sure on the path system. Um, I could I can find out and get back to you. Yeah. You had that. Instance. No, I don't okay. have that with me. So for some of you, after the after Sandy, was it kind of business as usual, and for others, it was twenty four four. Um, I, you know, I would say that it was not business as usual for anyone. Um, you know the. The, the damage was widespread across all of our facilities, um, and lots of people worked 24-7 at least for the first month just to get things back up and running. Um, and, you know, we all live in the region, so some folks were personally impacted. So not only were they working at, on, at work on flood issues, but they also had that uh, at home. So, you know, I think it was a sort of all-encompassing event, um, and I don't think that it was really business as usual for, for anybody. Okay. <laughs> Why if you describe the um, uh, flood protection system in greater detail, but on the electrical supply side, mm -hmm. how much you depend on utility power that fails and how much backup power you are trying to supply in case of an emergency? That's a great question. Um, so I'll... It, it sort of seems like three questions, actually. So the first one, <laughs> we're still investigating the impacts of salt on the distribution system, where it's under our control. So uh, we have a bunch of studies going on right now to, to really see what needs to be replaced in terms of cabling. Uh, what got wet, what didn't, what's still protected. Um, some of the facilities are, are older, so uh, the salt water may have impacted them more just because of, of their age. Uh, in terms of, um, now I'm forgetting the second part of that. Extraction of backup power. Backup for power. As part of uh, yep, what as kind of generator. Sure, as part of the short-term measures, we we ordered uh, I think on the order of about seventy generators. So we increased our generator generator capacity quite a bit. There was a fuel shortage as well in the region, so we have also enhanced uh, our fuel capacity um, because. You know, we were out of power for uh, upwards of a week in some locations, so you know we needed to ha we would need that fuel uh, to use those generators. And my second question had to do with the funding. About you showed about twelve million dollars mm -hmm. worth total for flood protection mm -hmm. alone. Did that come from FEMA or from all? Uh, Sure. So we're working with both FEMA and the FTA um, on funding uh, measures that we put in place and measures that uh, we need to do in the future. So those conversations are ongoing um, weekly, daily in some, in some instances. Um, so we anticipate that uh, some of these measures will be funded by federal partners, uh, and we're, we're working on that all the time. We've got a webinar. What is being done to protect the path stations in the future? Okay, great. So many of the photos I showed of those flood protection measures are within the path system. So doorways, penetrations, vent buildings are all being um, protected by uh, flood, flood barriers, flood gates, etc. Uh, and the main focus of all of those measures that we've installed this year was the path system as it withstand, withstood the most damage. Yes, excuse me. So uh, I have a question. I'm working for Massport, who's doing a similar study, and they could not be here today, so they really are eager to hear as much as possible. I have two questions. You mentioned architecture damage. What do you mean? Is it building envelope and uh, building envelope and materials within buildings? Yes. Okay. And the other question: You didn't mention debris, but usually after a hurricane, mm -hmm. you have a lot. Was that a major task? Uh, I, yes, it was. Uh, but again, I was more. I'm more focused on the capital side and where we're, where we're headed. And uh, debris removal was was a major um, undertaking right after the storm. Yes. Yeah, and just what is the path system? 
Could you describe sure. The, the PATH system is a commuter rail system between New York and New Jersey. Uh, you, you mentioned the flooding at LaGuardia, mm -hmm. um, but it was at low tide. So if, if that surge had happened at high tide, it would have been much higher. Have you, have you assessed what needs to be done there? So we are... Um, we're definitely very aware of flood protection needed. Um, we recently, uh, Governor Cuomo announced um, an HMGP grant, which is a, a state and federally funded grant through FEMA to do specific targeted flood protection at LaGuardia. So we're, we're, we're it's a known issue and we're working on it. Um, yeah, I have two questions, uh, short ones. Um, the first one is, uh, this was a horrible event for the Northeast, but in the Gulf states and Florida who have gone through like Category 5s, uh, they have learned a lot of lessons along the way because of very frequent events. Has there been an interstate effort to try to uh, find out from them about the electrical and those types of things? Absolutely. Wow. And, and we've reached out to uh, folks in the Navy. Uh, we're reaching out to uh, as many um, sister agencies uh, that we can to find out what they did and, and what their lessons learned are. And the second question is, uh, has there been any effort to like look at the in-car models on changing weather patterns to try to adjust your probabilities so that it's a, a more of a conservative uh, probabilities? Uh, That's a really good question. Right now, we use the 100-year flood elevation from FEMA. Um, and we have not done that level of sophisticated probability modeling internally. Um, we're relying mainly on the sea level rise projections, which are both at a 50 percentile and a 90th percentile, and using those numbers to increase um, uh, basically our capacity for risk. So we haven't done it from a uh, probability of a multiple event scenario at this point. We're more looking at, you know, what level do we need to protect to. Webinar? What measures, if any, are you looking at for alternative energy options for backup or primary power? That's a great question. So we have um, a number of uh, solar system, solar panel systems that are being uh, installed in our aviation facilities at this point, um, and we have one that is uh, in design at the moment in our PATH system. So we'll look to how those systems function uh, and whether or not they can tie into our emergency backup. Um, what is the um, lead time for some of your temporary infrastructure um, measures that you have before an event? And um, where, do you, where do you get the information that says, I'm going to implement, I'm going to install these temporary structures now? And what is the cost for doing it whenever there's no event? <laughs> okay. I'll see if I can remember that whole question. So, uh, you know, we, we, if we use Sandy as a model, so three days before the event, we really made the decision that it was going to have a, a big impact. We did not close the facilities until Sunday, um, and so that's a lead time um, anywhere. And I say Sunday sort of roughly. Um, I'm not clear. I'm not sure what the exact hours were for each facility, and it and it was different uh, across the agency. Um, so. That gives most of the facilities about a 12-hour uh, window to deploy some of the, the measures that I showed here. Um, some of them are meant to be done only a few hours before you might ex anticipate, so the water-filled barriers can go up rather quickly. Um, and like I said, in some areas, those uh, protection measures will stay in place all the time so that they don't need to be employed, uh, deployed in advance. Uh, as far as the cost of, of deployment, that's, it's going to depend on the complexity at that location. So we don't have uh, a, a staff that would go out across the agency. It would be facility dependent. They would use both in-house staff and probably uh, on-call contractors like we do now for sandbagging, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, the cost, these measures, I imagine, add additional cost to planning and projects. Is the return on investment for those additional dollars taken into account? Absolutely. And how is that measured? Sure. The one other piece of is, is loss of use part of that measure? So I think by loss of use, we think of that as criticality. 
Um, so do we have to have this up and running? Is it okay if it's down for 24 hours? Can it be down longer than that? So that's where that, uh, that calculation comes in. But for any measure that would add a significant capital cost to uh, a, a facility, we would definitely do a cost-benefit analysis to make sure that that is feasible. Well, first of all, that it's feasible financially, but also um, feasible from the location. We may not be able to elevate a structure, or we may need to dry flood-proof it or wet flood-proof it. And those, that kind of conversation would happen early in the design of, of a new project. Webinar? Can you tell us more about how exactly you're changing design guidelines based on climate impacts, sea level rise, storms, precipitation, and heat? Sure. Um, so I can give you a couple, of an a couple of examples. So we're looking at whether or not we would need to change um, our post-event uh, inspections due to increased precipitation and bridge scour. So do we need to go back in more frequently because we're getting more volumes of water? That, that's one example. And again, these guidelines are in draft form, so uh, we will be refining them as we go along. Uh, do we need to change the asphalt mix to be more resistant to heat over longer periods of time? Do we need to increase drainage or increase uh, green infrastructure installations where we can to capture more precipitation that comes down you know, quicker and more intensely? So those are just some examples. Um, but you know, it's every discipline. Do we need to have redundant uh, cooling in a data room if we're looking at longer heat waves so that we make sure that our data centers are, are cool? Um, it's cross-disciplinary, so it's uh, pretty extensive. Yes. One thing is, I think uh, New York is like a lot of airport on the East Coast Logan. Certainly, it's done on landfill. Mm -hmm. And uh, was there damage to your runways uh, done by the sea wave, the wave action? And we did not experience any airfield damage um, to the to the pavements. We had some roadway damage, um, but not on the airfield. Is this something your model about more frequency of storm is anticipating, or you're not there yet? Um, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that, whether or not the, the civil group is looking at the more frequent storm surge. Again, it, the, at both Newark and Kennedy, this is the first time we've had storm surge on the airfield. So, um, you know, we're not anticipating even when... In the, in the foreseeable future, having multiple events like that, you know, yearly. Um, the climate models don't tell us that at this point. Um, so we haven't looked at um, that level of impact. But again, these are, um, these are a work in progress, and they will be updated as we get more information about how the climate's changing. Governor? What improvements, if any, in your internal communication systems are you implementing to maintain contact even when general power is out? <laughs> okay, so IT is not my department, <laughs> but I will try to answer that. Um, you know, I think that um, there, we had internal communications through um, email mainly. Um, I was receiving email broadcasts, uh, even though I was not in the office um, after the storm. So uh, I'm sure that that's being made a more robust system, but I'm not aware of exactly how, how that's being done. Did you look at harbor gates like the ones in the Netherlands? So uh, you're talking about storm surge barriers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a regional Really, a, really a regional effort, um, and I know that the Army Corps of Engineers is doing a, a very comprehensive study of the entire region. I think actually, uh, maybe all the way down to the Carolinas. Um, so, you know, we would look to um, as part as a regional partner uh, with New York City, with New Jersey. There's lots of different partners um, that would be involved in that. So, the Port Authority specifically is not doing any research on that. The Army Corps is. Okay. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Thank you.
Those are really great questions and great answers. Uh, we, we, were, we were talking beforehand that while there was all kinds of tragedy and destruction in this area, it really is the ultimate laboratory to learn from uh, what happened and, and plan for the future. So uh, it's great to have this uh, knowledge, and I'm sure uh, others are, are taking note and, and planning. I, I, one, one question I had... Um, just in terms of your organizational change for this, it seems like there's a dramatic shift somewhat. Uh, are you aware of other organizations in, in the world that are, are starting to organize like yours? Um, I am aware that the MTA has a resiliency group within their engineering department um, mm-hmm. specifically focused on on their assets uh, post-Sandy. So yeah. even in the region, there's been shifts uh, yeah. within organizational structures. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, very, very good. Again, this is just one speaker in a series on resilience and climate change. Our, our next speaker is on December 17th. Uh, where Greg Fleming, who is Volpe, uh, director of our Technical Center for Environmental and Energy Systems, is going to speak on U.S. initiatives to reduce transportation-related global greenhouse gas emissions. So we'll look forward to seeing you all, all there. So let's thank Suzanne again.